um, well, um, Alfred Hitchcock once said that, that uh, an author, all an author needs is a pen. Anybody who makes a movie needs an army. And sometimes in the army, there's different points of view. And if, you know, if I had it to do over, I would have a slightly different point of view. Not about Blanche, who was as amazing as you heard here, but about other people. Um, of course, the New York Times. But if you look at all the other obituaries for Blanche, they all start off with woman suffrage person, and then talk about. But Kate needed to find somebody to make a, a good ending. Blanche didn't have to convert her mother-in-law. One thing that they agreed on from the start was the fact that women needed the right to vote. Um, as any of you who are married may feel, it doesn't take much for a daughter-in-law and a mother-in-law to get on a, in a battle. And um, if there was a battle over suffrage, it was a generational one. The first generation of women suffragists, the Elizabeth Cady Stanton generation, was fading away when Blanche was uh, at Smith. Her future mother-in-law was of that generation and was working hard to provide women's suffrage literature to the girls at Smith College. So even before they had met, they had pretty much agreed in principle, if not in, in uh, strategy. Um, does anybody have any questions before I throw a few things? I just things want to know a little bit about that, you know, how, how you all get to know about her life and how you decided to make a documentary on her. I mean, it obviously, like it, her life, you need to make a documentary. Right. But, you know, what's the process like? Uh, how, how, how difficult was it to, dig, you know, just getting information about her, getting know about her, like all the process of making that documentary? It's more difficult than you might imagine. Um, and, and yet, on the other hand, uh, when we started making the film, there were many people in our town who had known her um, as, a, as a young fellow, I'm, I'm the same age as her, her cousin Bill. Uh, you know, I remember bicycling by the, by the property and she always had an interest in agriculture and had these huge black Angus cows out there. So there, there was a connection. We're, at least up until this current generation, there's been a strong connection between the town and the family of the Ameses. So she was remembered, and there were a lot of, there's a lot of stories because she was unique. But many of the Ames women were unique. Her rival, Mary Frothingham, was a character as well, and much beloved by the town, despite the fact that she uh, started out as an anti-suffragist. And as soon as women got the right to vote, she became the campaign manager for her husband, who ran for Congress. Um, so, so there's a lot of a lot of traditional stories. When it comes to researching, um, she donated most of her papers to Smith College. So there's an extensive collection at Smith. The Harvard collection of, uh, of Oaks is a little bit more of a problem. Um, just recently, uh, a lot of it was released into the Internet Archive, so you can actually see some of the correspondence and, and, and things like that. Uh, but a bunch of it remains at Borderland. Um, and despite the fact that uh, Blanche was a brilliant architect with many innovations, she put a flat roof on the mansion, which has leaked three times and has <laughs> caused, caused a, a major problem. So we're trying to get the stuff out of there. The problem for us as researchers is that that particular collection of stuff, which is a mixed bag of related plant material and related to you know, how much Blanche paid for her courses, um, is, was willed initially to the Historical Society to be sorted out and then sent to Harvard. And the two groups are in dispute over mm -hmm. who gets what. Um, so that makes it hard to research. Blanche did write articles. Um, she's famous for an article from 1931, uh, which uh, was quite controversial, actually. Um, 
as a good, solid Unitarian, she didn't have much good to say about the Catholic Church and its mm -hmm. stand on birth control. And she expressed that in a way that would have appalled her great grandfather-in-law who worked very hard to integrate the Irish into our community, um, since more than half of his workers at the shovel works were Irish. Um, but um, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to find the quotes you would like to find. Um, I did do a little additional research and about the, the quitting of, of uh, what essentially is today Planned Parenthood, the Birth Control League. She and her sister were the two founding people. And essentially what it was was a very socialite kind of a thing until the uh, 1920s when Margaret Sanger suggested that they needed to turn it into a mass movement. And then Blanche really got uh, yeah, into, into that. But what happened was, uh, against her wishes, uh, in a big campaign to raise funds, they pointed out to uh, readers of, the, of one of the big newspapers in Massachusetts that 250,000 women on welfare had children in the previous year. Blanche never believed in anything other than birth control as a way for women to have control over their lives and over their bodies. It was never about, let's get rid of the poor people. Um, you know, I'm, as a historian, I'm one of those guys, let's find the feet of clay. So I was the one that kept saying, you know about the eugenics here, you should check on this. Uh, and it's, it's sort of like bombs in the Ukraine, sadly. You know, a bomb would fall here. There's a member of the family that belonged to the American Eugenics Society. There's another one over here. There's another one over here. Never a piece of evidence that Blanche believed in eugenics. Despite the fact that she was a very competent uh, botanist and uh, those turkeys you saw in the film, she actually was, was breeding turkeys for resistance to uh, a disease that was very common back then for them. So uh, she was always experimenting, knew her science, but did not ever suggest that eugenics was a way to go. More questions, please. You're all masked, so nobody will know it's you. <laughs> um, I have a question. Yes. Um, it is said that um, when her and her husband were interested in building Borderlands, that they had initially went through a formal architect in Boston, ended up firing him, and taught herself architecture. How would a woman in that time frame be able to teach herself architecture? Uh, <laughs> first of all, it wasn't the, the highly technical um, trade that it is today. Um, all of her contemporaries in Easton were building uh, mansions. Uh, Mary Frothingham was building a mansion slightly after this. Her other cousin was building the what's now the administration building at Stonehill. It's gigantic. And what she did is she went home to Lowell again and um, sketched out the house that she was raised in. So Borderland looks a lot like her original home. Now the technical innovations were um, very special. Uh, there was a tradition in Easton that the mansion was made out of cement because she was terrified of fire. She wasn't terrified of fire. I don't think she was terrified of much of anything. <laughs> uh, but what they were afraid of was that if a fire did break out, the orchid, the dried orchid collection would be destroyed. So one of the stipulations was the entire building had to be fireproof. So she did her research. And the, and the big innovation was that instead of having uh, the supports of the building internally, None of the interior walls are weight-bearing walls. What they did is they built a wall, a wall and then ran I-beams across to, to hold the place up. And that was innovative for its time. Any, anybody that was using uh, I-beams and reinforced concrete, that's a big step forward. Mm -hmm. uh, we're sort of famous in Easton for our H.H. H. Richardson buildings. And that's half a generation earlier, and Richardson uh, despite the fact that his engineering firm kind of invented reinforced concrete, never used the stuff, which turned out to be a real problem because one of his buildings is right now on the verge of 
may be falling down. We're taking care of it. But <laughs> they, they, whoop, there's a big crack here. And oh, yeah, the beam that's holding up the second floor is rotted on this end and rotted on that end. So uh, as I say, we'll take care of it. But, um, Blanche's buildings don't fall down. She's amazing. We have a, a, a Frederick Law Olmsted Memorial Carn uh, in in our um, our town, and uh, after World War II, the Ames boys wanted to knock it down and turn it into a, a World War II memorial. It was originally designed to be a Civil War memorial that looked like a fort, but the Ames women, Mrs. Frothingham, the rival, and Blanche came down there, and Blanche had a model of the way it was supposed to look that she had made, held it up, and the men from the Olmsted Company went back and said, no, we're not going to do it. The, w the women say, we're not going to do it. And they didn't. Uh, and uh, it's, it's there for you to see today. More questions, please. Yes? I, I think that it's just fascinating that this character, this living person, has sort of been in the like the backyard of, of so many people for so long without the story being told. I would imagine for you as a historian, there are thousands of these stories. And sort of getting back to Anandita's original question of like, how do you how do you choose whose story to tell? And and I guess from your perspective, why do some folk stories become legend? You know, when so many other people are sort of doing the same thing? Uh, that's a good question. I, I'm actually working on a, a, a book about uh, Oakes's uh, grandmother, who was, she didn't know it, but she was a suffragist as well. What, what she did was convince her sons to run for office so that she could suggest <laughs> things like changes in the school. Uh, and. Um, you choose people because they're interesting and there's enough information that you could do something with it. And in her case, there's two years, just two years of diaries. She was the wife of Congressman Oaks Ames, the man who was censured by Congress for his role in the um, Credit Mobier scandal, the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. He was innocent, by the way. Um, we all believe that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and the case is pretty strong for him. But um, uh, she did destroy a lot of her own diaries and his diaries, which is unfortunate. But we do have these two years before he was in Congress. And uh, they were, uh, in that generation, um, they were um, anti-slavery people. They were uh, moving towards becoming strong abolitionists. He voted for the 13th Amendment. Uh, they hid fugitive slaves. So it's always been an activist family on both sides. Mm -hmm. I should put in a word for Ben Butler, another larger than life figure. The reason they put a price on his head uh, is he did insult um, Southern womanhood. That's the reason for the, because a, a Southern lady in New Orleans dumped a chamber pot on a union officer. And he said, if they do that again, they should be treated like a woman of the streets, which went against, um, you know, the southern virtue of, of, of women. It didn't help him that his nickname after he left Louisiana was Spoons, because the people of Louisiana claimed that every silver spoon in the state had disappeared, along with Mr. Bartlett. Uh, so he was a legendary and controversial character, but he was in favor of women's suffrage. Uh, the first presidential candidate, first male presidential candidate, to uh, um, be in favor of that. I talk too much, so. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I do too. Um, you had mentioned earlier that when you creating this documentary that everybody in Easton had this connection with Blanche Ames Ames and the family as a whole. So with these younger generations, with this dying connection, what can we do to try to keep that connection alive? Well, also, I, I think like, you know, with the, I think I, the question I have in mind, kind of like uh, a sub question maybe, because um, I like many of the issues that she raised, right, are so contemporary. 
Yes. And if we still need younger generation to invest in that conversation because obviously, like right to um, women's body, reproductive rights, it's still you know uh, I don't know where we are heading right now. Like right because it's only it's only not getting better. Um, voting oppression is a big thing, right? And women of color, people of color are not uh, you know still struggling to exercise to vote. Um, so her, what she did, her, the issues she raised are so relevant, but also younger generations are, should be part of that conversation. And making a documentary, I feel like this documentary is, uh, kind of adds to that conversation, right? So along with her question, my question would be like, you know, how do you think or how, whether you have thought about like you know how you can use this movie to kind of further the conversations well we'll show it to any, anybody <laughs> we're not picky uh, although it's ironic as a light, lifelong republican i've shown this to a number of democratic town committees they're much in favor of her and she probably one of the aims there's charlton who was there uh, at the end always introduces himself as, I'm Charlton, I'm the Democrat, mm -hmm. uh, because he's the only family member that's uh, a, a Democrat now. But I think Blanche probably would have simply over the issue of reproductive rights. And as we all know, you know, Clarence Thomas coughed today and all the, all the people who are concerned about the birth control issue in front of the Supreme Court had hopes, but apparently he could have signed one of those health forms that I had to sign. Um, the uh, answer at how do we keep, keep her name alive? Well, we, uh, we built a uh, unified elementary school or a building. It's not quite done. And I'm very proud to say that one of my student teachers from Stonehill led the campaign to name the school after Blanche uh, so that uh, the young women of Easton would have a role model uh, like the uh, people who uh, honor Governor Ames. Uh, that's the name of our high school, Oliver Ames. We just won the state. Oh, we just won the state girls basketball championship uh, over the weekend, and have oh 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 yes. And by the way, changed her opinion. No way, Anna C. Ames was so committed to girls' rights that when she built the gymnasium to go along with the high school that her husband built, it was required that there was an equal sport for girls for every sport there was for a boy. And we won our first girls state championship in 1913, only three years after the boys won their first state championship. Now, how did she prove to her friends that girls could play basketball? They played boys rules back then. Some of you, now you guys aren't old enough, but I'm old enough to remember that girls basketball was played in zones and the girls couldn't run around. Not in Anna's time, that was, they played boys rules, and ran full court like they do today. And she brought a bunch of her society friends out to watch a game, and then after the game was over, she had doctors come out and give medical tests to the girls to make sure that their hearts weren't damaged by the fact that they were running around. <laughs> so she was there. Um, and um, she also uh, was the head of the start of our music program at school. And uh, if you were a good player, male or female, um, you could play at her band, the Anna C. Ames Band. The only problem for boys was that the Anna C. Ames Band played in suffragette parades. So mm -hmm. if you were marching in a parade as a boy, you were supporting women's suffrage. Um, so it was an organized thing. I, I, I imagine in 1915, as it's been described to me, that uh, there were limousines driving all over, over town. Anna's limousine. Blanche's limousine and Mary's on the other side limousine driving people to the polls to vote on uh, on the issue. So um, the family does battle, but they do seem to be friends. The story in the family is that after women got the right to vote, Blanche always called up uh, Mary Frothingham, her former rival, and said, "Okay, who's the best Republican candidate this year?" Mm -hmm. And uh, they talked about it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have only two minutes left, so. Please fill that two minutes. Yeah. 
I always feel that I'm mansplaining when I talk too much. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Um, what would you say is probably your favorite part um, that was featured in the film or um, something you wish that was featured in it? I'm impressed by the fact that Blanche was such an athlete. Um, she actually won New England uh, state tennis tournaments back in the days when it was mostly amateurs. She was, she was fantastic. My other favorite story is that meeting that took place in January of 1915. There was one person there who was never ever discriminated against uh, as a, a person who couldn't vote. They invited one girl from Brockton who was 15 years old and by the time she had the right to vote, women had suffrage. But uh, that was, on, uh, that was we, we reenacted that uh, a couple of years ago with the pandemic stuff in the middle of it. Uh, that was a really interesting thing, people of all walks of life. And those are people that are even as amazing as Blanche that are totally unknown. There was a, a woman teacher in Brockton who gave up teaching, was supported by her sister who worked in the factories while she took a year off to fight for the suffrage amendment. Um, and then she got her job back, which I thought was pretty amazing. Um, there's a million stories out there, so you know, find your own story and get out there and tell it, please. Especially in this, this is Women's History Month. Yeah. Talk about your mothers and grandmothers. Yeah, thank you, Ed, for your time. And we really appreciate your joining because. Uh, we are still kind of in transition. Uh, you know, we were first event in person at the Women's Center, so we are looking forward to having more. We are actually go going to, we have four other, three other campuses, so we are planning to show the movie to all other faculties and staff and students. Um, and thank you for making such a good movie and very contemporary movie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.